what is what is really nice is that Bob and George and Tony have shown us that I and I is a bigger problem than most of us realize. I don't know about most of us in this room, but there's a lot of I'll, I'll call it apathy about I and I uh, by some of the municipalities and county governments. We'd like to do something about that, and it, and this is an educational step forward. By the way. Somebody mentioned about Brentwood, Tennessee. Who was that? There's a session on Wednesday, an ASCO-sponsored session on manhole rehab that's going to focus on, on Brentwood at, at one point. Uh, the city, assistant city engineer on the water side is just going to speak there, and uh, we've got a bunch of other speakers happening. I get to do this because there's a side of me that's still a big NASCO advocate, and um, I get to chair the uh, manhole rehab committee, and i uh, been enjoying it for a year. I'm going to do it for another year. Uh, but this session is designed to beat last year's session, which is which is going to be tough. Now, that session was called, what happens when solutions fail? In a manhole environment, sometimes failures happen. And in this case, uh, that was the session last year. The gentleman that I know headed that up. Uh, I got to try and beat that this year, and I think I've got something that's worth your time and effort. Uh, so Wednesday morning, think about it if you're here. And hopefully, we'll see you at the manhole session. Look, I, I think the next speaker I've known since his first grout school, probably in 2013, uh, he was the most. He asked more questions than anybody ever at any grout school. He's uh, he's he knows more than you'll find out today. But I do think that he's going to start to segue towards the afternoon session, which is about solutions, about fixing I and I. But he's going to tell you at some point there is no such thing as a silver bullet solution. But he's going to start to condition you to think about solutions. And I just enjoy this gentleman a lot. I respect him a lot. Please welcome Jim Shelton. Thanks, everybody. So uh, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, some of this is going to maybe feel a little bit like uh, plowed earth already because it's really going to build on the, f the previous three presentations. Uh, I, I do I and I work. I've been doing I and I work since the 80s. So I've got a pretty good history of doing a lot of things wrong, right? That's the nature of doing work that long uh, and, and been able to build up a an idea kind of like George did around what does work and what are the steps you need to do. And it, it, in my business, it's about asking the right questions. Don, Don talked about, I ask a lot of questions. It's because uh, that's the only way you can get the right answers. And, and in this business, really what we're really talking about is, you know, where is the I and I getting in? You cannot eliminate it if you don't know where it's getting in. How do I stop it? How do I prevent that from coming in? And then going somewhere else, and how do I get it to last a long time, which has been probably the biggest knock against rehab stuff. It's short term, it doesn't last very long, it's not effective. We've heard some of the reasons behind that, and, and I'm gonna hit on that. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump through this fairly quickly. We've been primarily focusing around um, uh, rainfall-derived I&I. It really breaks off into two main groups, infiltration, and, and you've got uh, really three components of that. You've got your baseline groundwater infiltration. When you get a rainy season, and that rainy season seems to be changing from when it used to be. I know when I started uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, April showers, Brang May flowers. Uh, now our, now our uh, spring rains are coming more in June. But that uh, gives you that seasonal groundwater increase. And then you've got the rainfall-induced infiltration, which is really the bulk of what most of our I and I programs are focused on dealing. Most of the technologies we have are really geared toward addressing what happens when it rains and it percolates down through what's effectively a tr French drain over every single pipe we've put in and, con and concentrates in and gets into the pipe there. There's also the inflow piece of this, which we don't usually spend a lot of time talking about, but which are usually the primary cause of our SSOs, our basement backup issues. And that's when stormwater forms into puddles or the stream level rises and it manages to go in. And then what I call clear water, other people call it private side, but it's the stuff that comes in from the houses that very, very few municipalities 
or willing to tackle because it's not even going past the property line, it's going inside the houses to go after and get that material. Now, when we think of I and I programs, most of us think about pipes that look like this, right? And these are what I call ugly pipes, and we've all seen them. The majority of the consent decree programs that have been out there are focused on doing these. One of the previous presenters talked about connecting the dots. These are those pipes that, you know, get those high NASCO PACP scores, right? They're fours and they're fives. And you think, well, those are the ones we've got to go after um, because they result in these. But if you notice in all of these pictures, they don't look anything like these pictures. And if you were to televise these pipes on a non-rainy day or not when it, the groundwater is seasonally high, they wouldn't look like this. They would look like beautiful pipe. I don't know why I did that. It would look like beautiful pipe. So my, my first lesson is don't confuse a pipe that looks like this as a non-leaker. These pipes, if you happen to be there in the middle of a rain event, leak like crazy. Sorry, I don't know why it's jumping around at me. Same with your liners. This bottom picture that you see here is a liner, right? Those liners, if you're there on a dry day, are not going to express that leakage. You've got to be there when it's wet, or if you follow Tony's idea, getting there right after they've lined it and before they've opened the tap connections to see what happens when these pinholes come through the, come through the liners. So the first lesson is don't confuse ugly pipe with leaky pipe. They're often mutually exclusive things. Some of the ugliest pipe that I've seen through flow metering have shown that they're really not in terribly bad places. <clears throat> Inflow sources, these are really good pictures of what we're talking about. They're not always there. They don't stay there the whole time. They will come down, you'll get a puddle around something, it will crash through the top of a manhole. A stream will come up and rise. No amount of lining, grouting, tap connection work is going to address these. These are completely different types of sources. Uh, so you've got to know where they are in order to eliminate them. That means you've got to get wet. You've got to go out in the rain to see where these things come. And then the last thing is private connections, right? Sometimes they're really easy to see. You go down into somebody's basement and there's a sump pump and it's connected directly into the sanitary sewer. Or you've got a roof drain that's clearly coming down. But in many cases, it's a lot more insidious than that. It's a floor drain that's punctured and it is actually acting as a French drain underneath the entire foundation. So we've got two main objectives for every rehabilitation and replacement program or I&I &I program that we've got out there. It's to stop the groundwater, stop the rainfall infiltration, stop that inflow, and then to extend the life of the pipes. Well, we do the first one by sealing, right? It's the, the whole point here is to lock out that leaking joints, those defects, those inflow connections. We extend the life of the pipe itself by doing two things. One is fixing those defects, stabilizing those defects, and also stabilizing the pipe bedding, because once your pipe bedding is compromised, that pipe tends to continue toward a fracture, continue toward a break. So each program should, should do that. Now, if you're looking at a program that's focused on I&I, &I, as I said, you've got to figure out where is the leakage coming from? And these are all the sources that I've come up with for where a leak can come in. And there's no technology out there that addresses all of these. And there's no technology that's gonna remove the I and I if there's no I and I coming in through these sources. So this is what George is talking about, about targeting, right? You've gotta detect and then you've gotta target where the water's coming in. In my experience, most of the programs I and I programs that have failed, the WSSEs, the Miami Dades, uh, the Jefferson Counties, you name these programs that have spent billions of dollars and they've gone right back into another 10 year consent decree, is primarily because they didn't think about where the leakage was coming in. They didn't identify it and then apply the technologies that are necessary in order to do those. So you gotta ask yourself, Where's the most leakage coming from? As these guys have said, you prioritize it for where the worst stuff is. Well, it really depends. This is a typical uh, flow meter analysis, right? The red line at the bottom is what you get on a dry day. It's just your normal diurnal curve. Everybody in the wastewater business should recognize that. 
The blue line's at the top. That's your rain hiatograph coming in. And you can see what happens when it rains, right? This is clearly a basin that is leaking. But what kind of leakage? What does this tell us about which of these sources are contributing to this? Well, rain gauge, the rain uh, flow meter data is the first step. You can look at this graph first off and see that you haven't returned to normal for days afterwards. So unless you're in a big flood situation, chances are the inflow is not causing that issue out on the far end of that curve. You've got a rainfall-induced infiltration situation going on. But if you look at the jags in the peaks of this graph and you notice that they correspond to rainfall slowing down and picking up, clearly you've also got some inflow. So there's a real art to being able to interpret these hydrographs and understand what sources of leakage are likely at play. And of course, if you've got a basin that's 75 miles, it's gonna to tend to obscure where these sources are. So there's a sweet spot for how small your basins need to be. So if you're looking at the total volume of leakage coming in to your plant, this is the organization of worst to least worst for what's happening to you, right? So leaking liners, leaking joints at mains, those are your big volume contributors, right? Leaking tap connections, mainline defects. The ones that are down at 15, 15, 16, 14, those tend to contribute less volume, but tend to do contribute peakier stuff. Now, if you get a graph that looks like this, where every time it rains, it comes screaming up, and then drops right back down again. If you're spending your money doing mainline and lateral rehabilitation here, you're probably not using your money wisely. This is an inflow problem. Think about those pictures I showed you for those manholes that were going underwater. That's where these big peaks are coming from, right? So if you've got a basin that you've got this characterized in, you need to get your engineers, you need to get your field staff out there with the rain slickers when it's raining to find where these locations are because these are the ones that contribute your peakiness to it, right? So the roof drains, cross-connected inlets, leaking manhole frames and covers will leak hundreds of gallons of minutes with just a couple of inches of rainfall on top of it. It'll take an awful lot of mainline, lateral lining and tap uh, rehabilitation work in order to eliminate those types of leakage. So the, the key here is prioritizing your rehabilitation based on leakiness, right? It all begins and ends with where those leaks are. And you start that with the flow metering. And why do we start with flow metering? Because it's broad brush, right? We're taking a high level view of where we're coming from. I typically like to use, there's a lot of different uh, flow monitoring philosophies out there for my, uh, for my money, the sweet spot is that five to 10 miles per flow meter basin. It's not the micrometering uh, technique that Stantec has popularized. Uh, it's not the big, big basins that we used to do when we were doing 30, 40, 50 miles per meter. It's that sweet spot. It gives you enough resolution that you can differentiate between meters when they're upstream from each other, uh, but they're small enough that you can see the differences in the types of leakage that come in. Once that's done and you've interpreted those hydrographs, you can then start to look at what are the next set of techniques? What are the SSES techniques that we use? And quite frankly, there haven't been a lot of new SSE to SSES techniques developed since EPA's manual from back in the 80s, I think is uh, the first manual I had. So it's, you know, smoke testing hasn't changed dramatically. It's not that big of a, uh, not that sophisticated of a technique, but it's very useful if you've got these I and I sources. It's very useful if you've got uh, rain, rain connections and storm drain connections. We also do a lot of nighttime weiring. Uh, we go out in the wet season and weir. Uh, this is a corollary to the micrometering. You can also do this with uh, with metering techniques as well. It's a little, it's a lot cheaper actually to do it with nighttime weiring, but it lets you start to take. <coughs> Eight, six, eight, 10, 12 mile basins and start to dial that down into basins that are actionable basins. And then as I said, nothing beats actually getting out into the rain and actually seeing where connections are that are going directly in. Only at that point, when you've got the leakage characterized within a basin, within an area, 
uh, can you do that? And it's at this point you've really got to start getting used to terms like neighborhood, development, sewer shed, holistic. The thing that I found most gratifying about listening to three guys ahead of me were they're saying things that really have been in the know in our industry for at least, I'd say, 15 years. George would probably say a little bit longer than that. Uh, but quite frankly, there's a huge portion of the engineering and utility population that still don't get that. And that's why so many of these problems, so many of these I&I &I reduction programs fail because we're still doing find and fix. We're not treating things as a holistic rehabilitation, going in and doing everything within that neighborhood. And I'm going to show you some videos and pictures about why it moves around. It's only until that point it's only, it's, it's only once you've gotten to that point that you should start televising. A lot of the regulatory programs that came out in the uh, late 90s and the early aughts, they had just televising everything. And so many of the big programs that failed, failed because everything was, it happened to coincide with PACP's coding system. Hey, if it's a four or five, go get it. It had nothing to do with whether it leaked or not. You use the physical condition assessment, though, to define what type of technology you want to do. So if you're looking at your pipe, it can tell you, can I grout this? Do I have to line it? Can I burst? Do I have to burst it? Do I have to dig it up? So it leads to the question, if you've prioritized on leakage and you've now televised it to determine what type of technique, where should you focus your rehab dollars on? Well, that really depends on where the leakage is coming in and what these two guys, the last two speakers, really focused on, what are your goals? Are your goals to reduce overall volume? Is your goal to reduce just that peakiness that's in there? What do you need to get out and why? So many of these programs don't have a good, solid problem definition. Engineers love to solve problems. We hate to spend the time defining what the problem is. Most of us suck at it. We're just not good at it but defining what your problem is, what your root cause. We've heard that statement from Tony like six times. is so terribly important before you move ahead with any program. And to, and to George's point, quantifying how much you need to get out, where's that red line and how much you need to get below it, is critical to defining success. Because if you don't know where the finish line is, how do you know how hard to run? So bangs for the buck. Biggest bang for the buck are your inflow sources. These are your man float, manhole dishes. However, manhole dishes don't work but once, right? As soon as you put a pick hole through them, they leak. Or more than that, even if you're very careful and take it out, that seal will break. And we've done uh, lots of times where you just take the, the hose from the truck and put it on there. It, the, the dish may look beautiful, but it's not going to get a good tight seal unless you clean that frame up. But if you do it right, it's incredibly effective. Raising those manholes that are in streams or swales uh, are real important too. The private side is the second biggest bang for the buck. It's really hard to do administratively, but the, some of the biggest peak leakers come from there and they're really cheap fixes. A clip clean out in somebody's yard from their lawnmower running over a plastic cap contributes hundreds of gallons in a rain event. And putting a cap on it is so simple, but you gotta go find them first, right? Same with uh, roof drain connections and uh, punctured floor joints. Now, after you've done all of those, uh, you're into the main aspects and the biggest bang for the buck at that point, which is really what most of us think about from I&I programs, really depends on a lot of variables. So some maximums. Private side's a must, but it's never a standalone. The deeper the sewer, the more the leakage. The shallower the sewer, the more the leakage. Now that sounds like an oxymoron, but they both do apply. The leaker because it's in the groundwater more, the shallower because the water hits it faster many times, especially the more south you move and the sandier soils you get. The closer to a stream, a gutter, a swale, a floodplain, the more leakage you're going to get. Inflow always trumps infiltration when it comes to peak flow. And several medium rains almost are always uh, worse than one big rain. Okay, It's just those storms that come one after the other that are bad ones. If you don't seal everything hermetically, you're not going to get all of the leakage out. If you want significant I&I &I reductions, you've got to do all of the components, or at least most of the components. I'm going to skip past this. We've seen these pictures in Tony's presentation about the leakage coming through the liner. I'm going to see if I can't get this one to play for you real quick because I think it is. 
instructional. This is a 65, I'm sorry, this is a 35 foot lateral liner coming in from the clean out. It's been lined. The main has been lined. All of the water has been locked out of the system, but the groundwater is still there and it's pushing out the end of the lateral liner all the way at the clean out, 35 feet away. This gives you an idea of how far these things will migrate and why having end seals on your liners is so stinking important. Some truths about I and I removal. Structural repair is not leakage control. Spot repairs do nothing to reduce I and I. They're wonderful structural repairs. We use them all the time, but don't think by uh, putting a cure in place point repair over your brakes that you're doing anything. Mainline lining doesn't remove much I and I. I'm going to give you some slightly higher numbers than you heard before, but uh, many of the programs, I always think about Jefferson County, we went in after they finished their first consent decree and they'd removed 5%. They had lined hundreds of miles of mains, but they hadn't done anything with the taps. Manhole rehab does very little, removes almost no I and I in the larger scheme of things, except for the inflow. The barrels don't contribute that much because there's such a small square footage of the area, unless of course they're in a really bad area. Sewer rehab will do nothing to remove, ion, uh, remove inflow, right? If you're lining pipes and you've got an inflow problem, you're wasting your money. You're not getting out the leakage that you need. And you won't get significant RDI reductions if you've got significant private I and I issues. Bottom line is the more components you seal, the higher your I and I reductions are going to be. Now these are control basin techniques that are used where you, where you use a, a basin where you're not doing anything and a basin where you are doing something to remove the variables of antecedent conditions from it. Blue is pre and pink is post, right? So you see that movement. It's similar to what George was showing in his. This is the best basin we've seen for mainline lining alone, 32%. Typically what we're seeing, if you only do mains with end seals at the manhole, but you don't adjust the taps and you don't adjust the laterals in the teens, uh, you're not going to see real high numbers. That's not holistic. If you do all of the components, though, you do the mains, you do the taps, and you do at least the lower portions of the laterals, you're going to see in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s if you do this. These are holistic techniques. And it doesn't matter what technology you're using. If you want to do all lining, like Tony was doing, if you want to if you want to do all grouting, if you want to do a mixture of these techniques, you want to throw in some pipe bursting, it doesn't matter as long as you're getting all of the components. Here's a grouting. It's a pure grouting program only. This is 47% uh, I and I reduction from just doing the mains and the taps alone, right? So you start to get a sense for what these different techniques can provide you between not holistic, partially holistic, and fully holistic rehabilitation. Similarly, you can use all of the techniques, but if you only use them in portions of the system, you see your numbers are still going to be depressed. They're not going to be in the 80s. They're going to be in the, in the 30s and 40s and, and low 50s. So what are the single biggest effects uh, on I&I &I and longevity? Uh, the single biggest is rehabilitating the leaky assets, not the ugly assets. If you take nothing away, take that away. With regard to longevity, it comes down to the quality of the installation, and Tony hit it hard. It's inspection, and it's not just inspection at the time it's being done. It's going back and looking at it afterwards. And then the single biggest impact is holistically sealing it out. Not many engineers really understand how to specify these trenchless technology very well. So you need to recognize that. There's really little uh, actual knowledge in most of the engineers that are out there around how to actually specify getting this work done. And when we write performance specs, in my opinion, we give too much credit to most of the contractors that are out there for what they actually know how to do. So if you're really looking for effectiveness and longevity, you really need to find a team of contractors and engineers that really, really know what they're doing and have the data to back it up. So these are my conclusions. Uh, I'll, I'll let you read them. I'm not going to read them at this point, but I'll take any questions you might have at this point. Being, uh, being from an engineering background, when you look at a lot of smaller municipalities with limited funds, in what direction do you coax them to use those right out of the gate? 
Yeah, so when, when we're working with the smaller utility systems that uh, never have enough money, uh, it, it, it is always a, there's always a tension there between what needs to be done and, and how much they have. In, in most cases, those are the systems that are actually the, in the worst situation, right? They, they haven't spent any money there. Uh, and it all starts with really defining what is their problem definition? What do they want to achieve? And then working with them to identify what's the, what's the most cost-effective way to get them there. And most of the time, quite frankly, it's identifying what the gap is between how much money they need to spend to achieve that goal or the time it's going to take to do that and, uh, and trying to find the best possible plan for them to do that. Most of them fall short of having enough money to do it, uh, but you gotta start eating the elephant, right? You gotta start chewing at it somewhere. So the idea is to define the problem and then go find the leakiest neighborhoods and go do those. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, so, so what I found is uh, there's, there's, a maximum in the, there's a maximum in the I&I &I business that if you put flow meters in the ground, that's a good way to stop the rain from coming down, right? It just always seems to go that way. Um, I would say 15 years ago, we would have said four months. 10 years ago, we would have said six. We're at the nine to 10 month period now. It's a lot of money for uh, flow metering, and it also is a lot of time, right? You can't do anything. You know, if you're a utility and you've got to make an action and, and your engineer's telling you, got to wait till I have the data. But you need to get, uh, in, in my mind, you need to get at least three storms that are two and a half inches or greater in, you know, if you're on the Atlantic side of the, of the country, uh, and then all the smaller storms that are in there. So you can start to see what happens, what's the difference between a two inch storm and a three and a half inch storm can be quite significant. You've also got to have enough storms to know that one wasn't a fluke. And you've also got to more and more with, uh, with climate change, we're seeing uh, cloud burst happening in one area and not in another area. So you've got to have enough data to suss through that as well. So right now, my recommendation is nine months. Well, we talked about small communities, Jim, or the, I guess if you were the regulatory in charge of the regulatory god in the universe, how would you get more municipalities to buy into implementing these different techniques and the different uh, need to take care of I&I? &I? I mean, you see a lot of that budget constraints and uh, general unacceptance. Yeah, so yeah, so so get, getting communities to even want to spend money on this versus the police station or the library has always been a difficult thing. Um, I, I'm working with a consortium of, of uh, communities. There's 14 of them going to the same treatment plant in Pennsylvania, and there's uh, the three smallest boroughs. It's always the small boroughs. We don't have a problem. We don't have a problem. Um, you know, it's, it's like any other 12-step, right? Your first thing is admitting you have a problem, and it's hard to, hard to get them past there. If, if, I, if I were the regulatory king, I think I would make certain things mandatory as part of their as part of the permit, I would require uh, on an every ten year basis uh, that a flow monitoring program be done by an independent company, and that that data be QC'd. I will tell you that there's a lot of flow data out there that's complete BS, right? It's really hard to get very very good flow monitoring data, uh, so it's very important that that be uh, sharply QC'd. Uh, very skeptically QC'd uh, because you're going to spend a lot of money on that. I think if you did that, that would be enough of a lever to at least get past the I don't have a problem portion of the problem. Good question. <laughs>